Inside Outer Limits is a regular feature on the Paranormal UK radio network. Now the Chris Evers, Philip Mantle, Inside Outer Limits Radio Show, Flying Disc Press, Outer Limits Magazine endorse any of the products you may have heard advertised at the beginning or the end of this show or inserted into the middle of this show. The only products we do endorse are those that are strictly affiliated to Outer Limits Magazine or to Flying Disc Press. We now hope you enjoy the show. Thank you. Hello everybody once more and welcome to yet another edition of the Inside Outer Limit radio show with myself, Chris Evers, the man from Outer Limits magazine, and the original Prince Philip, he is UFO royalty you know, that's Philip Mantle, hi Phil. Uh, good evening Chris. Is that my new title for you there, the original Prince Philip? Yeah, why not? <laughs> oh, that's excellent, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> um, what have you been up to Phil? Well, as, as usual, Chris, you know, preparing um, new books for publication, both yeah. now and, and next year. But um, I had an interesting little development during the week. As many people will know, I've been involved with uh, Calvin Parker yeah. and the Pascagoula case from 1973 for the last, you know, th- two or three years or so, and published two of Calvin's books, of course. Now, I haven't told anybody this, so this is the first time I've told anybody. When Calvin had the encounter, he claims these these creatures got hold of him, and he felt some kind of injection, you know, and that calmed him down. Mm-hmm. And um, when he started writing his books, Calvin had no documentation to go with it whatsoever, Chris. He'd lost whatever he had in Hurricane Katrina. Yeah. You know, I think his house was under about 12 feet of water, literally. Oh, my God. So one of my jobs was to hunt down anything paperwork-wise, photographic-wise, related to his and Charlie's encounter in 1973. Yeah. So going back a couple of years, um, the Centre for UFO Studies, because Alan Hynek was on site at, at Pascagoula, sent me their file on the case. There's not a lot in it. It's mostly newspaper cuttings, but there was a very intriguing one page in there, and it's called Puncture Wounds. Yeah. And it's it's dated October the 13th, 1973. So it's two days after the event. Mm -hmm. It is typewritten on an old typewriter, and it says that the author of this letter or report, whatever you want to call it, uh, examined physically examined Charlie and Calvin and found puncture wounds about them. Doesn't give an author to it. Um, and it, So we published that in Calvin's second book. We called it The Puncture Wounds. Now Calvin, he says, the only person that examined them was Dr. James Harder. He was on site with Heineck. He wasn't a medical doctor. I think it was, a, you know, his, his work was in engineering. Yeah. So we assume that it was Harder that wrote this report. In the report, it mentions that photographs of the puncture wounds were taken. Mm-hmm. However, there's no sign, you know, of these photographs anywhere. And then, out of the blue, uh, earlier this week, we're now talking, you know, uh, late July 2021, um, a gentleman at, at the Centre for UFO Studies sent me three photographs that he'd found in a file. He wasn't looking for them, he was looking for something else. And on the back of one photo, there's two photographs sort of on one page, if you like, Chris. Mm-hmm. On the back of them, it says Charles Hickson, Pascagoula, October the 11th, 1973. And then on the third photograph, it says Calvin Parker. And there, two, the one of, of Charles Hickson is some marks on his arm. The one of um, Calvin Parker is some marks on his foot. Now, the date on the back of these is October the 11th. The date of that report is two yeah. days later. So whether they are connected or not, I don't know. But they are interesting, nonetheless. They, these are photographs that we believe were taken 
either on the day in question of their encounter or shortly thereafter. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm, we're, we're working, uh, Dr. Irina Scott and I are working on a new book for next year, uh, and uh, these will be included in it. Well, that's fantastic, Phil, because that kind of gives more credence to the story yet again, you know, and it, it, it really backs it up. I mean, if taken on the 11th, so the event happened on the 11th, sorry, these were about, around about the 13th. Um, it, it gives more credence to the story, backs up what they're saying, uh, puncture wounds, puncture marks, whatever. It gives it gives more uh, validity to the actual case, doesn't it? Because it's it, unlike it, Travis it Walton who's um, going through it at the moment. Yeah, I mean, you know, the puncture wounds document was fascinating and still is in its own right, Chris. Yeah. You know, um and these just came out of the blue. Like I said, the gentleman that, that was looking through this file wasn't looking for any of these, he was looking for something else. He assumed that I already had them. Yeah. Because I pestered the living daylights out of them for stuff, <laughs> you know. But he thought, just in case, I'll scan them and send them to Philip. So he scanned, you know, both front and back. There's handwritten um, information on the back. And w what we'll do, we'll, we're going to show them to a couple of um, medical people. Mm -hmm. You know, doctors or, or nurses who work in, in that area, and I get their comment, and, and we'll leave the reader to make up their own minds about them, like, like we do with most of this yeah. uh, information. Yeah. But it certainly gave me a bit of a perk during the week because we, you know, we're, we're convinced that there is more information to be had, and and this is just one example of it. It came, you know, like a bolt out of the blue. So there but, you go. But a fantastic bolt out of the blue, absolutely. Well, potentially, absolutely it's, it, it's it's fascinating, even if it turns out to be something mundane. Yeah. They were taken at the time. I'm pretty sure of yeah. that. So, um, but with no idea who took them, there's no names of it. Mm -hmm. So we'll we'll see. I wonder how our guest thinks of that today. Well, our guest this evening is a gentleman from across the pond. Across across the Atlantic, uh, a gentleman by the name of Preston Dennett. Uh, I'll not give him a too long of introduction because he'll only be embarrassed. But uh, Preston is is a, a a long-standing UFO researcher, part of MUFON, the Mutual UFO Network, and a prolific author in his own right. So we, you know, we'll we'll let him tell us a bit more about himself. But good evening, Preston. Good evening. Yeah, nice to meet you, Philip. I'm honored. I'm a welcome, huge fan. Welcome, <laughs> welcome, Preston. Hi, Chris. Can, can I can I just add something to that, Phil? He's also a regular contributor to Outer Limits magazine as well. Oh, so, uh, first and foremost, thank you very much, Preston, for the articles that you have sent in for us. Hey, very happy to do it. Thank you. Yeah, it's great. So, Preston, thank you for agreeing to come on the show for an hour tonight. M much obliged. Um, just for those that uh, are not aware, Preston, you know, give us a bit more about your background. Who is Preston Denny? How, how did you get involved in this world of UFO research? <laughs> I was dragged into it kicking and screaming, not voluntarily. <laughs> <laughs> I hated UFOs. I was a huge skeptic, uh, but found, you know, heard a report on the news, 1986, a very famous sighting, JAL, JAL Airlines, Captain Kenji Tarochi. It's That's up. the isn't that the Alaska incident? Exactly. Yeah. Yep. And that intrigued me just barely enough to start asking people within my family, my friends and coworkers, and I got a huge shock. Uh, it was bad news. I found out a lot of people that I knew were having traumatic encounters. Yeah, it upset me pretty bad. It hit home. I felt scandalized. Uh, and had to readjust my entire worldview. Uh, that's. That's how I was sort of pulled into this. Uh, it hit home for me like a ton of bricks. And uh, yeah, I became obsessed. I wanted to find out the truth. It, gives, it, it, it kind of reminds me, although I wasn't skeptical, uh, Preston, or maybe I was to a degree, I was certainly naive. I, I, I began my, you know, dipped my toes into the UFO pond in, in 1980 with a local organization here called the Yorkshire UFO Society. Uh, and I too was amazed when you start asking questions uh, about 
you know, and what you find out. I'll give you an example. A colleague of mine, he, he, he worked um, as a waiter in a hotel. And it, it was in the kitchen of this particular hotel. And uh, they were all smartly dressed, you know, and they had to be clean and tidy because they were waiters at quite a prestigious hotel. And um, he was involved in UFO research. And they were all, all the rest of the guys were making fun of him. And he said, but we used to have one lad who was a punk, punk rocker. And although he was clean and tidy, he had the mohawk and the tattoos and everything. But he was a, but he was a quiet guy. And then just out of the blue, he, he turned around one evening and said, look, stop taking the mickey out of, out of this lad. Because I had a UFO encounter myself. So, you know, you, you lot have no idea what you're talking about. Well, my colleague said, yeah, I was amazed. He said, because he would have been the last person you would have thought of to come out with anything like that. And we've often said that when you when you raise the topic uh, in a, a group of people, you'd be amazed that, A, what they know about it, or B, that somebody in it somewhere has had a, a sighting, an encounter, or, or whatever. So so you, you, you have this light bulb moment then, Preston. So, you know, you're thinking, oh, this, that it might be something to this. I've got friends and colleagues who've had these experiences. So where did you go from there? Well, you know, it said it changed your worldview. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, sure did. I mean, it's one thing to read about it or hear it on TV, but when your own brother tells you he chased a UFO down the street, when your sister-in-law says she saw gray aliens face to face, uh, when someone you've worked with for years has missing time, uh, it hits home. So I went pretty much straight to the bookstore and I was going to disprove it. I'm going to be like, you guys saw Swamp Cass, even though I, I mean, I knew they weren't, they didn't. I mean, it was pretty clear right from the beginning. They were sincere. They weren't misperceiving. Uh, and I was shocked to find out how much information there was, that there was a government cover-up. I ended up buying all the books I could, joined all the UFO organizations, became a field investigator. I started tromping through the fields late at night. <laughs> I wanted to see them myself, and I eventually did. Oh, great. Uh, well, what did you see then, Preston? Tell us, tell us about your own sighting or encounter or whatever it was. Yeah, I've had a number of them over the years. Probably one of the best was late at night. I had been over at my brother's house, Mark, same guy who saw a UFO. And I'm like, okay, I got to go home. You know, I've got to work tomorrow. And uh, it was about 11 o'clock at night, maybe midnight, late July in 92. And I'm just heading around this tight hairpin corner at about three miles per hour. This is in Woodland Hills, California, pretty dense suburb. And I saw what I thought was a bird swooping down out of the sky towards me. It was pretty clear it wasn't a bird because it was glowing. I thought, well, maybe it's a firecracker. It's late July, not, not too long after you know, the 4th of July celebrations. But it wasn't that either. It was a ball of light. It was an orb about the size of a, a golf ball, maybe. Mm. And this, this darn thing <laughs> swoops down right in front of my windshield. I mean, like a foot away. I slammed on the brakes, and this thing is just starting back and forth right in front of my windshield and uh, my you know my jaw drops my eyes get real wide and this thing just sort of darts back and forth hovers for a second and shoots straight up and it's gone and uh, here's where it gets weird because uh, I forgot about it I complete completely left my mind I should have turned around and said you know I saw a UFO or an orb or whatever this thing was but I didn't I completely completely left my mind and I don't even remember what happened after that hmm. so I, I could very well have had missing time uh, and now I know what I, you know, by then I had interviewed a lot of people who had you know, seen a UFO you know, come over their car or strike them with a beam of light or what have you and they said you know I forgot about it I'm like what how how could you forget about a giant craft hovering right in front of you well now I know so, so what, what exactly was your aims and objectives then, Preston? I mean, like I said, when I first uh, got involved, I was very naive, um, knew very little about the subject, uh, apart from reading, you know, uh, a number of books. I, I assumed, you know, 
uh, wrongly, of course, that if I wrote a few letters, attended a few lectures and, and read a few more books, then uh, within no time, I'd, I'd have all the answers, <laughs> uh, you know. But it soon became apparent that that was not going to be the case. So with yourself, did you have a, an aim, an objective by, by getting involved in this subject? Something you wanted to achieve or know or, or what was it? Uh, yeah, I mean, I just really wanted to get a handle on it because here I had people who I knew weren't lying. I knew they weren't misperceiving or hallucinating. This was in my family. I mean, I've had direct family members have humanoid encounters. So I sort of, I don't know. I kind of, I, I, I don't know quite why I'm so obsessed with this, to be perfectly honest. Uh, I started looking to my own past. I'm like, do I have direct contact? And I couldn't really point to anything that says so. Um, now I think probably I do, because I've had a number of really close sightings, um, coupled with telepathic communication. I mean, honest to God messages. Uh, so, I don't know, it just kind of grew on me and I could not let it go. I was really upset with our government for covering this up. That kind of really angered me. And uh, that once, I mean, once you're in, you're in. It's hard to extricate yourself from this. Yeah, it's one of those subjects that um, it kind of grabs you by the throat and won't let go. Yeah, Absolutely. totally agree. I know what you mean because I, you know when when my I've got two daughters and when when my children were were young I I tried to give it up for a short while just to spend some more time looking after the children and I, I think I managed it for about six months but that that and, and I'm, I'm I'm probably exaggerating there but that was about the best I could do you know the letters and phone calls still used to come no matter what I was doing so I couldn't I couldn't escape it so. Um, so, so, exactly. Yeah. yeah. I started getting yeah. friends. Friend, you know, once I asked out all my friends and family, coworkers, their friends started calling me. Oh, what happened actually is I heard a quote from J. Allen Hynek that one in 40 people have had an onboard experience. And I thought, no, no way. That's way too many. I know that many people. So that's what got me to ask everyone. And boy, that caused a firestorm. People started coming to me out of the woodwork. I, I became the guy to go to to talk about UFOs. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's strange. I mean, I, 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 in, my, in my early years, I worked in a, a factory. And, um, you know, I've had, I, I've had every little green man joke you can imagine by some of the guys that I worked with. There were some tough fellas I worked with. But in, on July the 23rd, 1984, we, we finished work at 10 o'clock that evening here where I live, just just outside of the city of Leeds in West Yorkshire. Lovely summer's evening. I was driving home. I, I wasn't married at that time. And, and I, we saw these strange lights in the sky um, over, the, over the city of Leeds. And, of course, I went back to work the next day. And some of the, the guys that I worked with, um, some of whom had been, you know, at the forefront of telling these jokes, They'd seen them themselves, you know, the night before driving home. So the jokes with those guys kind of uh, dried up at that point. Uh, <laughs> and uh, as for missing time, I had a period of missing time. I think it was from 1974 to about 1987 when I first got married. You know, but nothing, <laughs> nothing to do with UFOs, I can, I can assure you. Um, but no, it is amazing when you start talking to people. Um, like we said, how, how they, you know... Either they've got an interest, or they've seen something, or or, or have gone through something, and um, it happens all the time. It really does. So, Preston, you you you're also known for your writing, your books. So, how did you transform from being, you know, this this researcher, somebody who who had experiences and sightings themselves? How did you fall into writing? Was that something? That you wanted to do or, did, or did, did it just happen uh i kind of always wanted to be a writer you know i looked into writing science fiction and wasn't having a whole lot of success with it and ufos came rolling into my life <laughs> uh really powerfully but uh i investigated for 10 years 
Um, I was writing articles for various magazines and journals, uh, but yeah, I had investigated for 10 years before I finally started writing books. It was my sister-in-law, Kisara, who does a lot of the illustrations for my books. I worked closely with her from the beginning. I'd bring her in and be like, okay, draw this UFO, you know, draw this person's ET. And she's like, Preston, you should write a book. I had stumbled upon this huge wave of sightings in my hometown, Topanga Canyon. And uh, on like June 14th, 1992, a bunch of people saw UFOs on that evening. They called the police, they called the local newspaper. The editor of the newspaper called me up and asked me to investigate this incident. And I had collected like 20 different sightings on that one night and uh, started finding a history of encounters in this area. And so Christie's like, you should write a book. <laughs> you, know, you really need to write a book on this. You've got enough material. I'm like, hmm, all right, maybe you're right. Uh, so that's how it sort of all rolled out. So, so what was your first book? What, what was it called? Uh, well, you know, when she said that, I started looking at my materials, and I wasn't quite ready to put a book out on that because I was in the middle of an investigation. So I, my first book was One in Forty, which basically, what's well, the first one I wrote? I should say it's the second one published. Um, one in Forty was all my family, friends, and coworkers, their encounters. But the first one I actually published or got published was uh, UFO Healings because I had run into this lady who had a lifetime of encounters and she described this incredible event where she had been diagnosed with a, a tumor in her fallopian tubes, had an encounter, you know, she was scheduled to have surgery, the whole deal. The night before surgery, she had an encounter, goes to the doctor for surgery, and the doctors do all the pre-imaging for surgery, and, and came in and said, well, uh, you went and had surgery, didn't you? <laughs> and she said, no, no, of course I didn't. And I said, well, we can't find your cyst. It's gone, and we know you had surgery because there's fluid here in your fallopian tube that is only present after someone has surgery. And they're examining her and they're like, what if, you know, you have laser scars here on your abdomen? What happened? And she just completely denied it. She knew what happened, but she didn't want to tell them. Uh, so I'm like, wow, you know, this was before and after x-rays showing the disappearance of this tumor or MRIs. And I knew of other famous healing cases, you know, from Jacques Vallée. He had one, Dr. X in France. Um, there was a number in the literature. So I started digging in deep and I found 30 right off the bat. I'm like, wow, this is a lot, too much for an article. So I really dug in and I found over 100 cases and that became my first book. So Preston, what is your latest book? Uh, my latest book is Wondrous, 25 True UFO Encounters. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is people who've had really extensive encounters mostly, but a wide variety of cases, really. An interesting USO report. I had three whistleblower accounts that I've been sitting on for a while. Mm -hmm. Just never was able to fit them into another book, so I put them in there. But yeah, landings, sightings with telepathic contact. But it's the onboard experiences. Those are the ones I think, you know, face-to-face -face contact. Yeah. They have the most information. Those are so interesting to me. So if people want to purchase these books, I take it this latest one is already out. Yep, yep, right. on Amazon, online retailers, uh, so, yep. Okay, do you have a website yourself? I do, yeah, if you just use a search engine on my name, it should take you there. Actual address is called prestondennett.weebly.com, and, uh, yeah, I put all my books out there, excerpts, so if people want to you know, take a look at my research, I try to make it as accessible as possible. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, people can contact me through my website as well. Okay, so if people want to purchase something, folks, that's where you need to go. Now, Preston, there are many places around the world. You know, um, in Great Britain, for example, you know, the United Kingdom, we have areas around Yorkshire where me and Phil are. Phil's in West Yorkshire, I'm in East Yorkshire, and um, there are what we call, um, oh dear, what do they call them, Phil? I forgot what they call them. 
Well, portals, put, whatever you yeah, want to call the, them. The, 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 today's, Hot spots. Yeah, today's um, slang word is portals. What it used. Yeah. In my day, it was window areas. That's the word in, I was looking it, for. <laughs> yeah. In 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 Russia, they call them M zones. M for being mystery. Yeah. So it's, it's different names, but so, the same thing. So Preston, yeah. I, I noticed quite recently that there was some. Um, information on your Facebook page regarding uh, New Mexico and something like a top two uh, postings regarding top ten events in New Mexico. Do you want to tell us about those? Yeah, yeah. I've written a number of books about various states here in the U.S. I started with California, sort of moving across the, the United States, covered most of the Southwest and other states that I think have something to contribute. Definitely New Mexico is one of them. We've had a lot of cases there like, you know, Roswell, of course, and the, the Socorro UFO landing with Lani Zamora. These are some pretty influential cases. So I wanted to cover these states because they've really helped shape our understanding of this UFO phenomena. Yeah. And uh, yeah, what I found is really interesting, actually. Um, pretty much every area I've covered does have what we call them hot spots, mm -hmm. uh, UFO wave areas. And every state I've covered has them. It seems like every location on Earth, I think, probably has certain areas that are more prone to sightings than other areas. Or like Arizona, it's Sedona. Uh, Colorado would be the San Luis Valley. New York would be the Hudson Valley area, upstate New York. I don't know quite what's going on. <laughs> But something is drawing these objects in. Yeah. So if you had to pick one place in the United States that was the hottest of hotspots, where would you say? Oh, that's a tough question. Um, I... we've, we've got an hour. You're okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to pick my own state, actually. Uh, the uh, Santa Monica Mountain Range, the Santa Catalina Channel. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is where I started getting reports of USOs, unidentified submersible objects. Yeah. Really, right from the beginning. And when I looked into it, I started, you know, connecting with other researchers, and they all have cases. So there's Ann Druckel. She's a very early researcher here in this area. She had cases. But Bill Hamilton, Robert Stanley, Barbara Lamb, Yvonne Smith. They all had cases. And I started documenting them and cataloging them, putting them on a map. And they were clustered in this one area mm -hmm. of uh, the Santa Catalina Channel, sort of from Santa Barbara south towards re really San Clemente, a pretty good mm -hmm. stretch of area here. And just thick, thick, thick with UFOs and USOs. Yeah. Um, leading out into the water, all the way to Catalina Island and all the way inland over the Santa Monica mountain range. Yeah. So hundreds of reports. It's a huge hot spot. I've taken people out there and we've had successful sightings just going out there on UFO stakeouts. It's a great place to see UFOs. It's hugely active. Of course, um, off the west coast there of the United States, this is where the Nimitz and uh, event took place, you know, the gimbal and the Tic Tac and so on. And, um, you know, it's... It, What's your opinion of the release, recent release by the Pentagon of the uh, the long-awaited June 25th report, which was, of course, started by the um, the COVID uh, release uh, funds uh, back, back signed by uh, President Trump late last year? Yeah, yeah, I was pretty excited. It was movement, finally, because our government has completely denied UFOs from the beginning, which is really disingenuous because they know it's true. <laughs> Yeah. From basically the Roswell incident, the Malmstrom incident where they shut down the missiles, and yeah. you know, UFO landed at Edwards Air Force Base, filmed. They know it's real. And for them to deny it with the Conning Committee and Blue Book and Robertson panel, uh, so there's nothing to it. You know, go away. It's no yeah. threat to national security. And so this report came out and did a 180 degree sort of turnaround on that. Yeah. They said there, there is something to it. And it might be a threat to national security. Yeah. But it was it was layered with lies. It was a completely bogus report. They're like, we're beginning to study it. I'm like, well, beginning. Mm -hmm. You've been doing this for 80 years. 
And they're like, well, it might be radar clutter, it might be balloons, it could be a foreign government, it could be us. I'm like, us? I mean, don't you even know what you're doing? Yeah. They left open the possibility of ETs, but I was pretty disappointed with what they put up, nine pages of layered lies. Yeah. Myself and uh, Phil, we, we discussed this in um, one of our shows, uh, uh, well, a couple of weeks ago now, and uh, we actually recorded it before the show went out. As we are this evening, this you know we're now on Sunday afternoon here in the United Kingdom, and this will go out on Wednesday of this same week. But um, myself and Phil discussed this, and, uh, and I did say to Phil, I can't see them looking at any historical reports or commenting on any any historical reports, which is precisely what they did. But the thing that amazed me is, you know, are they in the position? to actually say, you know, well, we've got all our fully trained combat pilots and we've got fully trained naval personnel who we trained, but yet we can't always, you know, accept what they're saying as truth. Ah, we've seen, we've seen this X, Y, Z object flying around and, well, yeah, but it could be, and the, what did they come up with? They looked at reports going back to 2004 but the majority of the reports they examined in the release were from the previous two years so really from stuff from what 2019 2020 maybe 2021 some things from this year you know and of course out of the 144 that they looked at they, they only explained one of them away and they went back to an old excuse which they came out with in 1947 it was a balloon <laughs> yeah, I had to laugh when I saw that. And uh, for them to say, "Oh, there's no evidence that this is a technology or extraterrestrial," is such a big fat lie. Because uh, they have these on multiple sensors, they said it themselves. These things are accelerating at very high speeds. They're clearly metallic. For them to say that this is not evidence uh, is. Yeah, I mean, the only word I can think of is disingenuous. Lies. Absolutely. Did you? I saw a report from, um, I think he's an, uh, he's an astronomer. Is it Neil Tyson DeGrasse, DeGrasse whatever they call him? He made a guy. comment about... Sorry? That's the fella. That's the fella. He'll do anyway, Phil. <laughs> he uh, <laughs> came out with... Um, a report, or he said something that, it, you know, it, there could be glitches on the uh, the devices that we use to see them. So eyeballs had glitches in them, radar devices had glitches in them, you know, and of course, you know, when these things were flying so close to some of the aircraft, of course the aircraft and the pilots had glitches as well because, you know, they actually saw these things with their own eyes. Right, yeah, I love listening to these recordings from the pilots because they let out a string of curse words. They're, I mean, they're clearly yeah. impressed. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, what I, I think he's, yeah, Neil deGrasse, deGrasse Tyson, oh, there's a guy who needs to get abducted. I mean, honestly, does well, he not know that many astronomers have seen UFOs? Clyde Tombaugh, well, exactly. Robert Ex Shaldak. Exactly, exactly. Alan Hynek. The Close Encounters man, an astronomer. Yep, yep. Lincoln to Paz, yeah, many yep. of them. So, Preston, what are you currently working on? Oh, I'm always keeping busy. I've got three books or so I'm working on right now. Uh, one is with this amazing woman from Florida who's had fully conscious contact since age 14. Uh, contacts actually go earlier than that, but she kind of faced it when she was 14 years old and had a big experience. And the memory came back to her being taken on board, talking to Grays, uh, who told her that they would be coming back for her. Mm. And she says, well, I'm going to remember it from now on. And she has. Mm. Uh, she, she's now in her 60s and has had a lifetime of contact. It's really probably the most extensive case I've ever uh, and talk to, and I've never heard a story quite like this. Uh, so I'm working on a book about her experiences. And pretty excited about it. I mean, her story is incredible. Mm -hmm. Is there anything you can t actually tell us about that? Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, she's been physically examined, of course. She's 
describes a lot of the experiences we hear about. Uh, but one thing that I find very interesting is that she was trained how to fly these UFOs. Mm. Uh, this is something I do hear from a number of experiences. Like in my book, Onboard UFO Encounters, mm -hmm. I covered 15 cases. And four of the people in that had this experience where they were taken to the control room, the helm, taught how to fly the craft or sat down in the chair and allowed to fly it. And this is what she describes. And this has kind of been a, a lot of what she's dealt with. She's also been there when other people are being taken on board. And she sort of helps calm them down and explain to them what's happening, why they're being taken. So she, yeah, she's been taken on tours through the solar system, which may sound unusual and science fiction-y, but I have to tell you, I've gotten a number of cases like this. I mean, what's that research? Leo Sprinkle. He's a pretty yeah. prominent researcher. He described this. He was described being taken to see the planet Saturn. Mm -hmm. And I've had a number of people tell me this. And she's describing this as well. So some really incredible stuff. Yeah, of course. One of the, in back in the back in the nineteen fifties, we had um, the contactees, didn't we? And people like George Adamski. He, he was ta talking about being taken to see. Uh, I think it was Venus and and other places as well. Yeah, the contactee era of the nineteen fifties. Uh, a lot of researchers have tried to debunk this unsuccessfully. I think. I mean, mm -hmm. clearly, some of these guys probably were telling some tall tales. Uh, but the contactee era did not end, as many people think it did. It was forced underground by the huge flood of reports of, you know, abductions by greys, which were much more lurid and scary and got a lot of media attention. But I'm still getting reports that match precisely what people were reporting in the 1950s. Human-looking, friendly ETs yeah. invite you on board. There's a wide variety of encounters. There's a bell curve. It can be very traumatic, or it can be entirely benevolent. Yeah. Amazing. Preston, I'd, I'd like to butt in and ask a question here, if I may. I, 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 one thing I like to ask our, our American colleagues, uh, and it's, it's fresh in my mind because I've just finished watching a little TV series about it. You wrote UFOs over New Mexico. Now, you can't... You can't mention New Mexico without mentioning Roswell, can you? <laughs> no, you, you know, sure can't. Yeah, as much as you'd like to get away from it sometimes, it's, it's never going to go away. Is this a new it's case, it... Phil? I've never heard of this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the TV series I've just been watching is called uh, Roswell, The Final Verdict. It's okay, but, but nonetheless, when we were speaking to you tonight, I, I thought, well, I'll, I'll ask Preston, what, what's, what's your take on, on what happened at Roswell back in 1947. Well, we know one thing for sure. It wasn't a mogul balloon with dummies. I mean, we know this. What I like about Roswell is it's a UFO crash retrieval story. There are a lot of them. Roswell is not unique, but I think it's the best verified one because a lot of these crash retrieval accounts depend on maybe a handful of eyewitnesses. Uh, Roswell has I think it's 300 some witnesses at last count. And it's amazing when you dig into it. Um, there's eyewitnesses who saw this craft coming down. Eyewitnesses who saw it on the radar scopes. Of course, Mac Brazel, and, uh, who saw the debris field, and his neighbors and his children. And uh, talked to the people who guarded the wreckage, who picked up the wreckage, who flew the wreckage, who saw the bodies, who. I mean, right down the line, we have tracked this incident from beginning to end. One of the things I'd like to ask, Preston, and again, I've asked the same question of all the sort of what we'll call the main Roswell investigators. You know who they are. He's not with us anymore, but Stan Friedman, um, Don Schmidt, Kevin Randall, etc. Let's assume, for sake of argument, Roswell was a crash of a vehicle not of this earth. Okay, well, let's just say for sake of argument. Right. All right, and it landed, it crashed near Roswell, New Mexico in 1947. Why would the government cover it up? Uh, lots of people talk about a 
you know, Roswell being the, the cosmic Watergate. But then don't, but leave it there. They're not going to give you a reason as to why this would be. What's your take? You know, you're saying it's a cover-up. Well, why would they, why would they cover it up? Yeah, I mean, gosh, I wish they didn't. They did actually, there was that very famous press release, which was retracted the next day. And they said flat out, we've got one. We've recovered a flying saucer. And this went off like an atom bomb. I mean, this was international headlines. And I think they realized they'd made a huge mistake. They'd opened up a can of worms, retracted it, and called it a balloon, and started threatening witnesses. Uh, I think they realized they were in over their head a bit. They did not understand exactly where these guys were from, what their capabilities were. Uh, what, And it was a policy I think they had adopted from the very beginning. And, uh, I, you know, you're asking me to speculate here. I don't know why they insist on covering this up. I think it would have been handled a lot more easily. It would have been much more to their benefit to just... Yeah, yeah that, that, that's that's the thing that puzzles me is 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 why the why they would do it. I, I accept that they could well be in over their heads, and uh, but here we are, you know, almost seventy five years later. Yeah, yeah. would would the, would there the still be the same reason to cover it up now as there was then? Uh, and I went around all the main Roswell researchers and couldn't get a a a simple reply from from any of them um i think it's greed i think it's power it's money i think that's ultimately what it comes down to well that, that's exactly uh my my opinion is, is that perhaps if if roswell was a crash of a et vehicle perhaps the the opposite would have happened the cold war is just starting to hot up in 1947 can you imagine the propaganda the u.s could have got from this you know first contact and it happens on american soil sadly it goes drastically wrong but you know the space visitors chose the america uh, and not the soviet union and and through through back channels and leaks or whatever you you want you could say not only have we got our nukes because in 1947, America was the only country that had nuclear weapons. Guess what we found when these guys arrived, you know? And you could scare the bejesus out of any of your opponents. You really could. But, but, but you know, we're led to believe that the exact... What, what I can't understand is, right, we've, we've got technology that's not of this earth. How could we recognise any possible threat or anything else because surely the technology as, as you pointed out Preston would be beyond our understanding so how could we know I mean we're talking about here within hours because you, as you said you know the press release was put out and then withdrawn within a matter of hours so we're talking we've recognized we've identified something that's not of this earth, and for some reason they have to cover it up. This is a, a, a species that cannot communicate with other species on the on this planet. For example, you know the most intelligent species next to us on Earth is is said to be the, the you know the the porpoises and the dolphins. We can make them jump up and catch a fish, but we can't say how you're feeling this morning. You know. Uh, and we can't we can't communicate with them, but yet we have something that's not of this earth, and we can identify it immediately. I find that extremely puzzling. I really do. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's my understanding they were communicating with these guys um, telepathically. They spoke English. I mean, we know this when people are having first-hand contact. But how, how does how does that happen? You know, if it's first contact, how do they know how to speak English? <laughs> how did they uh, find us in the first place? Let's let's assume they've got interplanetary travel because they would have to have that. They're not they're not from our solar system. We know that. So how would they find us in? The, if these are ETs, how would they find us here on Earth? 
Uh, well, I mean, I think they've known for a very, very long time. I don't think this started in 1947. We know this. I mean, just looking back through history, we've got evidence of extraterrestrial visitation going back millennia. Looking at Egyptian hieroglyphs, petroglyphs, cave paintings, medieval wood carvings, Renaissance paintings. We know they've been around for a while. You know, Native American oral traditions. Other indigenous cultures talk about sky people. So it's pretty clear here they've been around for a while. It definitely ramped up in you know, the modern age of UFOs, coinciding pretty much exactly with our use of nuclear power. And that seems to what got us noticed. Um, that's certainly something a lot of researchers have remarked upon. And UFOs do seem to be interested in anything nuclear. A lot of the witnesses I've spoke with were people who are you know, on board a submarine that carried nuclear tip torpedoes or a you know, guided missile cruiser that was nuclear powered or the Malmstrom Air Force Base. I talked to a first-hand witness there. They are all about <laughs> observing our use of nuclear weapons. Yeah, Chris, Chris and I had, um, one of our guests was Kevin Randall. And, um, you know, Kevin is well known for his research into Roswell and, he, and his, his writings. Uh, and he's writing a new book for for me for Flying Disc Press for the anniversary next year, and it's it's provisionally entitled Roswell Revisited. And, and what Kevin said to us was that he had taken another look at the um, well, let's call it the evidence that Roswell was a, a an ET vehicle, and he still believes it is, by the way. But he said that that evidence is not as as convincing as he first thought it was. What, what do you make of that? Uh, yeah, I wonder what exactly is going on with uh, Kevin Randall and the Roswell uh, story, because he did come to LA once to give a presentation on it, and he was backpedaling on a number of these witnesses, which I found curious, uh, like Glenn Dennis and Walter Hout and uh, Frankie Rowe and you know all these witnesses who I think are very clearly sincere. Um, so I am not sure why he's sort of... Well, well what he told us, he, he, just, he just re-evaluated the whole lot. And, and he said the, the, the evidence that uh, Roswell was ET vehicle was constantly just out of your grasp. He still believes it is, don't get me wrong, because I, I have spoken to him uh, recently as well, but he just thought it was just... Just when you think, you know, this, this, this is it. This is going to prove it. It's just yeah. out of your grasp. Uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll stay with Roswell. One of the things, again, that bothers me, let's assume it was, again, an ET vehicle that crashed. Where's all the paperwork? You would, I mean, you would have people from a whole range of disciplines working on this, surely. You know, from cryptographers, you know, metallurgists, physicists, physicists, you name it. Uh, and in 1947, it, you, we, you would have had to probably have to have prepared something like, uh, you know, the Manhattan Project of that size and of that secrecy to work on it. But yet, where's all the paperwork, this, Preston? Where is it? Where's where? Surely it, it would have generated a mountain. Yeah, um, I would certainly think so. But no. and, and and we know with these projects, even the Manhattan Manhattan Project, which was probably the most secret thing on Earth at the time, building the atomic bomb, secrets were were leaked then to the to the to the Russians as they were to the Soviet Union at the time. So even with all that level of security there, they couldn't keep it quiet. But yet with Roswell, we 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 don't have anything. I mean, not a thing. Oh, we have some. There's definitely some uh, documents that have been released through the Freedom of Information Act talking about UFO crash retrieval incidents and Roswell. Uh, they're not fully documented. There's a lot of controversy surrounding these uh, sort of documents. And what we know, a lot of researchers have looked into this, is it was government policy not to record this with any kind of paper trail. Uh, they, they were, and this is something we see with other UFO incidents as well. One gentleman I interviewed 
He was an electrician's mate on the USS Klamagor. Uh, this is a submarine that carried nuclear missiles. And in 1971, they're heading up the East Coast, and a USO approaches and paces the submarine for 15 minutes. And uh, there was four people on deck, they were on the surface, who saw this, including the guy I interviewed, Ray Sats. And long story short, this thing darts away, the second in command turns to the commander and says, how do I record this in the log? And the commander says, officers who report this kind of incident do not move up in rank. It, so it didn't get into the log. These sort of incidents are not recorded. But we do have recordings. I mean, some of some of the pilots during the Second World War, for example, recorded it in their flight logs of, yep. of what we call the Fool Fighters. Uh, I just put one on on my Facebook page today from 1943. So they did record things. You know, that's why we know so much about it. It's just that there is there is nothing. There's no not one piece of physical evidence surrounding the 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 Roswell crash that 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 we can positively nail down. Uh, and and that just bothers me. I don't know why it just does. Yeah, Maybe Congre I'll... Congressman Schiff really tried to dig in, Congressman Schiff of New Mexico, and get some actual physical documentation. He was stonewalled every step of the way. You're well, right. I, I, I know he, he he got the GAO, the, the government accounting office involved. And I know one of the things that wasn't available was all outgoing messages from uh, Roswell Army Air Force from that date. So they did document it. They were just no longer available. But I know from our own Ministry of Defence, they used to destroy files on a regular basis. It was part of what they did. And it doesn't mean there was anything secret in them. It's just, you know, they were just gathering up shelf space and every... I think it was every six years they'd have a clear out yeah, yeah. <laughs> pretty much like i used to do with some of my stuff believe it or not but <laughs> that, no that i don't was... believe that phil because i've seen your um, office <laughs> well that was that was down to the ex-wife chris you never met her so <laughs> <laughs> you know well the cover-up is no joke i mean there is a government cover-up this is not a matter of speculation we know this Every intelligence agency within the United States has been studying this subject for decades. FBI, CIA, NSA, all of them. We have pretty much proven that there is a cover-up. Uh, this subject has been clamped down very hard. And I think that's why it's so difficult. That's the really frustrating thing about the crash retrieval reports. Is so, here so we have the best evidence, and we can't get our hands on it. So why do you think things are allegedly changing them, Preston. We've had the Pentagon report. They've to come back in six months, I believe, with with more information. Um, you have Louis Elizondo uh, claiming he ran a tip for the Department of Defense. Right. And the Department of Defense, to this day, as far as I'm aware, said he had nothing to do with it whatsoever. Uh, even in, even I've read I've read. Um, uh, Elizondo's resignation letter, and it's a what? Just a one pager. It's available. It's nothing secret. It's 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 online. And at no point in that letter does he mention a tip. You know, uh, it's to his boss at the Department of Defense. So if there is going to be, a, even if it's a narrow thing they're looking at, if we go back to the Pentagon report. They're only going to start with 2004 and only going to deal with military witnesses. Um, is that a lie or, or, or is it really going to happen? Uh, you know, I wish I, I wish I knew. I'm not holding my breath for any great revelations. I don't think they're going to talk well, about Roswell. No, no, I'm not, I'm, not, uh, I'm not going to Roswell. If we look at the Pentagon report, they mentioned they'd looked at 144 cases that kind right. of surprised me they also had a section in it that was even in a different color uh, encouraging uh, military personnel to step forward and to to um you know downplay the stigma that's been attached to the subject you had um what's the name uh, alex dietrich the the lady top gun um come right. out of the woodwork and go on the record and say nothing's going to happen to you. You're not going to lose your pension. She she was sort of the, the precursor to that. She's still quite vocal about it today. 
So let's jump forward, you know, in time. We, do, we, we know that there's a, they mentioned 144 incidents, one of which was explained. What about all the others? Yeah, exactly. I mean, is that going to be in one... the next? Is that going to be in the next report? I think. Um, uh, go, go ahead, Preston. Go on. Yeah, I, I mean, I think they're going to. I'm not sure they're doing this voluntarily. They're sort of doing this whole disclosure thing, kicking and screaming and dragging their feet and backpedaling. At one point, the Pentagon did say, "We have material for other worldly vehicles," and then they kind of stopped talking about that completely. Um, I want to see that. I want to see some better footage. And I'm just not sure we're going to get anything of any import or anything really meaningful from this you know, next re- release of uh, information. Yeah. I don't see them anymore. They've lied for far too long. I yeah. think they're, the only reason they're really doing this, I think the main driving force behind disclosure, is because it's to their benefit to say something. They are losing all credibility. We have so many whistleblowers coming out saying our government is covering this up, that if they don't do something, they're going to lose complete control over how people perceive this whole phenomenon. And that's why I think the driving force behind this. They want to remain in control. I think um, part of the driving force behind all this, Preston, to be quite honest, is the fact that the Chinese and the Russians do seem to be um, bringing out new technologies and are they using the UFO excuse um, as they did with you know when they were developing the the U-2 spy plane and and uh, the SR-71 you know back in the 1950s and 1960s and these UFO reports came out but some of them we now know where those aircraft that I've just mentioned are they doing the same today with this uh, the Tic Tac report and the Gimbal report and the COVID report and this recent release from the Pentagon, which actually, when it was released on June 25th, the one thing that I got from it was they were ordered to file out and to bring out another report within 90 days, basically explaining how they was going to investigate these sightings. Uh, so by the end of September this year, that's September 2021, there should be another report out from them telling us exactly how they're going to investigate these sightings. Now, are they using the, the UFO excuse, though, to increase funds? Because it seemed to me they said, well, we don't know if the human, we don't know if the Russian, we don't know if the Chinese, there could be extraterrestrial, but then again, there might not be any of those, but if you give us more money, we'll find out for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I ha- kind of have to laugh too. I'm like, sightings, really? You're investigating sightings, which have the least information on this subject. What about landings? What about people who are being taken on board? What yeah. about the many reports of UFO crashes? I mean, we have enough whistleblowers who are very credible high-level military industrial complex people and they're just completely ignoring that yeah so, absolutely and, 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 yeah let's talk about sighting something that's distant in the sky with that we can handle <laughs> yeah uh, I don't know so, well are they not by 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 doing what they're doing gentlemen are they, are they not uh, controlling the narrative because it, it, again in the Pentagon report they are they have already set up their own uh, reporting procedure and you have to follow that procedure uh, and are, uh, I think the intelligence services are involved as well and I think that's why they, they concentrated on the last couple of years so you know going back two years is when this reporting procedure was put into place but they're only dealing with the military uh, and that way they can control you know the uh, the flow of information, if you like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's interesting that they are now calling this a potential threat because the Conning Committee and all the other government reports said there's no no threat to this at all. Well, our, Which... our, own, our own Minister of Defence have said that for decades here, President. Mm. You know, not said it for, for decades and we're, we're allies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but from, from a military standpoint, I mean, they have got to perceive this as a threat. If it's cu- coming down and shutting down our missiles, hovering over our power stations, you know, going over these Navy craft and sort of <laughs> harassing them, so to speak. 
I can see from a military perspective why they're concerned. Well, it'll be interesting. I don't know how how it's released in in the states. It'd be interesting to see about what Chris was talking about when when it's budget time. When, when you know when the you know the American government are dishing out the money. It'd be interesting to see if there's any increases in 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 funding for for the various parts we've been talking about. Oh, you know we may not get to know. We'll we'll see anyway, won't we? we it, it's going to be interesting if nothing else. <laughs> the, yeah, well, the th- yeah. what interests me, Philly, is the fact that they, they claim that ATIP closed down, but yet we now know there's this UAP task force, um, which I think is actually a small task force. I think there's only two or three people involved with it. But, you know, they're saying, well, yeah, we investigated UFOs, but, but then again, we stopped when ATIP closed down. Oh, hang on a minute, you didn't. You just changed the name again and oh, give it another name, slide it away again into the background. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, yeah. I mean, that, that's the way government works, Chris. I wouldn't. Yeah. I wouldn't go. You know, put too much emphasis on that. Uh, it's like um, the place that used to handle UFO reports from from the public here at the MOD it used to be called DS8. Then it then it went to to be called Air Staff 2A. It was just an amalgamation of yeah. various units, and and the, you know, they they have to call it something. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, it, it can be something as simple as that, um, but, but the po- the point is because they don't tell you and don't explain it, you get you, you you get that feeling that they're deliberately trying to hide something. It's it's and sometimes they are, of course. We have to remember that it is the government's job to keep secrets. Yeah, you know, absolutely, uh, and keep us safe. Uh, so it is part of government to keep secrets. Well, it is uh, a secret. Sorry, yeah. Phil, I was just going to say, mate, it is a secret that, um, I don't know if you just heard that peeping noise on my phone, but that was the flying fickle finger of fate telling us time's up. <laughs> <laughs> That's that is from Ron and Martin's laughing, if you remember that one. <laughs> but no, it's, it's been an interesting evening, uh, Preston. We, we do thank you for your time. Give us, give us your website address once more, please, where... Anyone can either contact you or, or find the latest information about your books. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks, Philip. Uh, it's PrestonDennett.Weebly.com. I'm also on Facebook and Twitter. I've got my own YouTube channel. I'm trying to put out my research there. This is an important subject. It's not going away. No, isn't that a strange name, Chris? Preston Dennett Weebly. Um, <laughs> 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 oh, no, it, it is. I'm, 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 I'm actually on your website as we speak, Preston. Uh, and there's tons for everybody. There's tons of information about Preston's books. Um, there's a complete list of them. Um, just for those that are not aware, I believe you've done. Is it written 27 books, Preston? That's right. Yep. That it's shows you. That's more than you, Phil. <laughs> Yeah, it's more than me, but it shows you I've been, I have been reading what it says on your website anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but w- we wish you well with all your work and your various books that you both have for sale now and you're working on, Preston. And if we can ever help with anything, you know where we are. Yeah, yeah. thanks. I appreciate it. It was great talking with you guys. Absolutely, Preston, and uh, as I say, don't forget Outer Limits magazine. Anytime you want any articles in there, just get them sent over. I'm more than happy to look at them for you. Hey, I appreciate it. Okay, my friend, thank you very much for your time. Thanks for joining us on the Inside Outer Limits radio show. Thank you very much for your time, and good night. Inside Outer Limits is a regular feature on the Paranormal UK radio network. 